Hi, welcome to Tonko Cast number 19. Number 19. Yeah, our guest this week is the amazing William Joyce. Yeah, so Bill Joyce is one of the most influential artists of all time. Yeah, I remember as a kid growing up with his children's books, uh, Dinosaur Bob was always a book that was a favorite to read uh, before going to bed. And also there are many, many major films based off of his work, like Robots, I got to work on that movie, uh, Meet the Robinsons, and yeah, Rise of the Guardians, right. epic, epic. Um, and that's just like a sampling of some of the films yeah. that he's had an influence on. Um, but also, he directed a short film at his studio, Moonbot, mm -hmm. uh, that won him an Academy Award. That's the right. Fantastic Flying Books of Mr. Morris Lessmore. Yes. Right. Um, really beautiful film that had a very, actually a strong impact on us, um, leading us to go visit Bill in his studio as one of our first visits. That's right. So we had this opportunity to uh, talk with Bill, um, and he shared his incredible, insp incredibly inspiring stories of his journey. You guys are, are like Pixar's right around the corner, right? Yeah, yeah totally. <laughs> down the street. So when, so when Dice and I first moved into this studio, uh, it was up to this, where this little band of wood is, uh -huh. this used to be a wall, and it was empty. It wasn't, you know, obviously we did a lot of work in here, but um, when we first started, we didn't even have, in we couldn't get internet in here. Wow. So we actually, for one day, sat outside the Pixar gates and picked up their... Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> awesome. And just sat there. So like, sad. We were so afraid they were going to miss you. Yeah. yeah. How embarrassing would that yeah, be? Totally yeah. We're out of here, guys! <laughs> oh, yeah, man. That'll so make yeah. a great story when you're like... <laughs> So being, you're at the academy and they're talking oh, to you guys. Yeah. And you're old. And you go, yeah, we used to have to sneak across the street. To <laughs> but yeah, they're yeah, not far. Yeah. They're just down the street. They're so close, close. Which is nice because also they've been so supportive of us. It's That's cool. Really that is really incredible. sweet. Yeah, it's been really unexpectedly they've been so warm to us. So. Awesome. Mm -hmm. so even when we make stuff, they invite us back to bring it, show it. We always show it there. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. terrific. Yeah. Wow. So it's cool. Yeah. But you were but you were at Pixar for even longer than you were at Blue Sky, weren't you? Just uh, actually, almost almost the same amount of time, seven years, yeah. uh, both seven years exactly. So, coincidentally, I I left at the seven year mark, and then yeah, wow. And then you were there for twelve years. Twelve years. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So Robert was there for a long time, and, and Tonko House is three and a half. So we have three and a half more years to get it done before Dice is on too. <laughs> His seven-year cycle. Yeah. I'll join you in France. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Um, so the way this works, Bill, is it's pretty simple. We just have a conversation. We'll do an intro separate from this that kind of will be a How little do we more know structured, you? and yeah. we'll talk about a bit of that. But cool. Um, but yeah, we could just have a casual conversation. But I am curious about you guys work together. Blue Sky. Right. Uh, how long ago was that? That was. Uh, so well, I started at Blue Sky back in two thousand. So it's seventeen years ago, almost eighteen years ago. Um, and then already when I started, we we were just working on Ice Age in the beginning of Ice Age. But then, uh, Blue Sky just finished the test of Santa Claus. Of oh, Santa Claus. So yeah. I didn't get to work on that. But right. then I already knew. Uh, Bill and Blue Sky had yeah. this partnership, which obviously me studying illustration in school, I got so excited, like, oh my yeah, God, like Bill Joyce, you know, we get to work yeah. on his film, you know, so uh, unfortunately Santa Claus didn't get going, but uh, they were also working on this test uh, that's like a beginning genesis of uh, robots, robots. Yeah. and they did the little test, yeah. uh, that was really cool too, actually. Um, so Liddy, like Blue, I think Chris Wedge and you had such a special friendship. Yeah, we had, you know, John Lasseter had introduced us, oh, okay. and it was it was after Toy Story, and and uh, and he kept telling me, "There's this guy in New York. He's got this little company. And I really think you should meet him." And and then it was even after uh, um, Bugs Life, and. John wanted me to come to Pixar and, and, and come just make movies there. 
and uh, so I spent a lot of time out here, and uh, and we came really close, and to moving, and but in the meantime, he introduced me to Chris, mm -hmm. and and so he, Chris and I hit it off, and. You know, so we're talking about doing a movie, and so we they first they optioned Santa Calls, my book Santa Calls, and we're gonna make this great, you know, hol uh, uh, holiday extravaganza, this like Christmas movie to end all Christmas movies, and and this and Fox said, you know, that's great, you know, if you can do it for under forty million bucks, and mm -hmm. we could never get anywhere close. Mm -hmm. I mean, because this was, you know back in the day I mean hair was still super hard mm -hmm. fabric was super hard um, and this had tons of hair and tons of fabric Santa Claus without hair yes I mean it was like <laughs> and uh, and so it just we could never get the budget down and and so I can't even remember when I said well yeah I've got this robot idea and did these drawings and those drawings became the, the, the models for the test that mm -hmm. we did and and the studio Fox said that's awesome that looks like that will make a great movie what's the story and we're like we don't know <laughs> <laughs> and so for all the time that they were working on um, on Ice Age we, Chris and I were off to the side working on, on robots and working on the story and going through different screenwriters and and working with, we worked with this one guy, uh, David Lindsay of Bear, who I ended up doing uh, Rise of the Guardians mm -hmm. with, and he's a wonderful uh, playwright and a screenwriter. He's won the Pulitzer Prize for one of his plays. And so his script was kind of the catalyst for pulling the movie idea together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then so many other people came in with their two bits. and and But they greenlit our movie. It was amazing. Uh, like it was like we'll we'll greenlight your movie if Ice Age makes over twenty million dollars its opening weekend, and we're like, yeah, okay, <laughs> man, I've never watched. You know, I was calling Chris every twenty minutes, like, <laughs> what are we at? What are we at? You know, back in the day, twenty million dollars in one weekend wasn't that easy, no. and Ice Age was supposed to be a pretty small movie to Fox's understanding, but. Obviously, well, then you, it did 43 or something, yeah, it did double yeah. what, yeah. And so it was like, okay, I mean, I remember sitting there so at the premiere and in New York at Radio City, and 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 Tom Rothman saying, Well, I hope you guys are teed up and ready to go because things are looking promising. And I was like, Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but away we went, you know, wow. yeah. that's right. So that's how you, you and I really uh, met. Right, right. I, I was actually uh, one of the first artists uh, to move on to robots and working with Bill. Uh, we had Mike Knapp uh, started around the same time. Greg Couch joined yeah. a little later. Yeah. And it was what a, a team. Very yeah. small, but yeah. very Power cool houses. team. Oh, yeah, it's fun. It's it was so much fun. Oh, it, we got so into the minutia of metal and you know <laughs> and, and we would get in these weird situations where like one weekend chris and greg couch and i were walking around manhattan and <laughs> looking at the wear patterns of the brass door guards at the waldorf historia hotel and the plaza and it Trump Tower, and because it was like you know this is where all the nice buildings would be in, our, in Robot City, right? And you know like where the other guys, the poorer robots live, would be more like Greenwich Village, and everything would be a mix of styles. Remember we talk about this, and but there we were standing around like you know, like taking pictures and leaning <laughs> over these brass. <laughs> door guards at the front of these hotels and like the doormen are like what are you guys doing <laughs> and I'm uh, like it's okay we're making a movie and uh, and the guys at at, at, at at the Waldorf and the guys at um, at the Plaza were really kind of like okay but the guys at Trump Tower ran us off man. Oh, <laughs> <my God. laughs> that's nice nice oh symbolic yeah yeah 
Yeah, so that's kind of how we yeah started working started that sort of the first time you guys yeah. touched base and then actually you know when we not to, to skip ahead a little bit obviously I mean tons Bill you've done just so much stuff from books to films um, but one important trip for us is when we left Pixar and started Tonko House our first trip was actually to go out and visit you uh-huh. um, and to just touch base with you and just see what you had built out in Shreveport and just talk a little bit about the journey and like what you know you had and it was just I just remember it being such an inspiring moment for us it's like oh my gosh and you're just so full of energy and kind of like I remember you guys you were just like go do it and we're like yeah yeah, yeah. we're gonna go do it we're yeah gonna, yeah and um but that That's was right. almost right that was like the trip that the started after that was the week after we, we had left Pixar and wow. we're like let's go out and, and visit Bill at Moonbot and uh, and it's pretty remote. Shreveport is a pretty remote place and um, takes I, two flights to get there, no yeah. matter what. <laughs> Sometimes know. three. It, it, <laughs> we actually, it was three flights, but we chose to drive, drive from Dallas. Okay, <laughs> that's yep. like a four-hour drive. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people do that because yeah. you just never know. Yeah, but there was something about uh, for us, I think, just the kind of energy, just the kind of feeling that we got from. You had built your own little kind of place out there. Shreveport mm-hmm. is obviously an important place to you, and it's home. Um, yeah, yeah, and it's, it really felt like that. We felt like we were visiting your home, yeah. your your cool. studio, your. But um, I just it's not even a question. I just really wanted to say thanks. Oh think, man, like, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm so flattered. I mean, yeah, for us it was huge, right? I mean, we were kind of before that, like, what do we do? And then we're like, what's the who's out there that's doing stuff? And we went and visited you, and it just felt like. You know what? You guys are out there making stuff that it's super cool, and and it was just that vibe of like, dude, we just want to make stuff. We're I know, I know the feeling. Like I mean, that's yeah. why that's you know that was the whole point of Moonbot was, can we do this outside of the mainstream, outside of the system? Can we do it smaller, cheaper, smarter, yeah. freer? Yeah. And it was intoxicating to have that much freedom in film. Totally. You know and. I mean, it, it was a theory that I was like, I know after working on all these different films that, you know, there's just a clarity of vision from the beginning and a few really talented, devoted people that, you know, and not all the second guessing that goes on that we can probably come up with something really pure and hopefully beautiful and, and it doesn't cost so much money that mm-hmm. if everybody freaks out mm-hmm. and I mean it seems to me like I mean that's why so much of what happens in features is that that sort of numbing um, quality of, of sort of rounding off all the rough edges you know it's yeah. because there's so much money at stake and the people that are shelling out the money want to have a hand in things and they get nervous and and they don't mean to like sort of diminish the product but that's what ends up happening Mm -hmm. and so I was like what would happen if we just had a bunch of money and nobody said anything other than go and and we didn't need that much money I mean it was actually you know I think our budget was a million dollars and it was 14 minutes of animation and I mean from what I do you know that's like it's usually a million a minute, you know, back in the land I was in, and it's more now. And, and but it was just, and so much of what we were doing, the way we were even working was like, was within limitations. And, you know, what I found is like, limitations make you, make you clever and make you mm-hmm. smart and make you make good choices. Even if you're backed into a technical corner mm-hmm. and it's like, there's no way we can make this shot it's going to cost too much money, mm-hmm. you know, it's going to take too much time, and you can figure out a way to either fake it or work around it in a clever way, and and it it makes you, I just, it forces you to be the best filmmaker you can be, mm-hmm. and I, sometimes I think that all the money that we get in feature land, mm-hmm. like, is detrimental to, to a lot of the the instinct that goes into it should go into filmmaking and you know the way we do uh, the process of animation is so uh, arduous and lengthy mm-hmm. that you know 
even if in the best circumstances, it can sometimes leach some of the spontaneity out of out of the out of the filmmaker, right? And so if you can, I always was wanted to go see how fast we could go, mm -hmm. and and just make it as instinctual as we could, and and so that was sort of the edict. And since when we didn't have that much money anyway, we had to work that mm -hmm. way. And I gotta say, there were days. <laughs> when we had literally an impossible amount of work to do and when we were filming the live, the live action parts or the of the of Morris Lessmore or, or on the the sets the miniature sets mm -hmm. that we built I mean we had this sound stage and we had this crew for four days and we had to do 216 setups camera setups and you know the math wasn't working out <laughs> I was like but we're like, wow, we don't, we're just gonna go. And we ended up buying three extra cameras. And uh, cause you know, we're using like, we went down to the Best Buy and got some, you know, good cannons, right? And that's what we were using. And it, it, by, the, by the second day we had four cameras working. We had four film crews. We had four setups, you know, going at the same time. And we would just jump from setup to setup, you know, match it with our storyboards you know to see and make sure we had the shot lined up the set dress it we only built enough set that we could there's only one shot in the movie that has everything we made every little tiny book we made three thousand little miniature books and all these bookshelves and we only could do one shot that really showed that whole yeah. room and so whenever we were doing other shots of it we had to like okay that shot's done so we would tear it down and build it over here and change it and set dress it and that was a whole different part of the building and there are different times when we literally there are four different sets being shuffled around and stolen from from each thing to yeah, run over and just in time to get the the shot that we needed for that and it was like sprinting i mean it was literally we were just walking in a circle in the sound stage shot 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 yeah. shot 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 and you know 20 hour days best time I've ever had in my life mm -hmm. you know never been so exhausted my back went out I was having to take just mega mega painkillers I was walking around at one point I was still painting sets right that we were like shooting like as soon as like I was done and but I couldn't bend over to paint anymore so I had to tie the, the paintbrush to a stick and I'm standing over there <laughs> sponging this this ceiling to make it look aged and stuff because I couldn't bend over anymore <laughs> and but it it was the best week you know and so I I really feel like that there is something about working that way yeah. that brings crews together I mean at the end of the I mean, our crew was supposed. To, I mean, these guys are, you know, these are tough. Like, this is these are grips. These are like teamster dudes, yeah. right? And at the end of it, they gave us two days, like for free, because they were so into what we were doing. Mm. And but the first day, <laughs> Joe Bloom, who was our production designer, he came over and he whispered, "He's like, I'm really, I'm really worried." I'm like, "What?" And he goes, "These grips, these guys, they're all talking about, you know." I don't think we know what we're doing. And I'm like, welcome to the movie business. <laughs> and I guarantee you by the end of the week, they're going to be on our side. And sure enough, I mean, they really mm. were, you know. So cool. Yeah, definitely more or less more. <clears throat> and not only did it win the Academy Award in the end, but also what was so inspiring for a lot of us, even for us to really think about, should we make a short film? You know, it ended up becoming mm -hmm. Dam Keeper. Is that what you guys did was just like you described how it wasn't just a conventional you know big studio short film making mm -hmm. yet like the quality was exactly that quality was just mm -hmm. it was just as good or even better than anything you've seen in CG and you guys used the, the actual stop-motion sets mm -hmm. and live-action sets and then CG combined and and then also and we had no idea if it was gonna work I mean, right. It was like we hoped it would. We had we just went. I just I think it's gonna be okay, but we didn't know until we saw that first composite. Mm -hmm. Like <laughs> 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 that that's just so amazing uh, and inspiring because 
also that you guys use the uh, the way you made the film, the way you funded the film was also to try to create this uh, app, mm -hmm. right? But that wasn't in the plan. That wasn't the plan. No. The, the iPad was announced when we were halfway through mm. filming, when we were halfway through the, the, the shooting the miniature sets. And we were like, this is, this is important. This is going to change things. And the weird thing was we've been using our iPhones the whole, through the whole shoot. You know, we had our, our, our um, storyboards and our reels up on our phones, and it was hooked up to this computer thing so we could always access whatever shot we were on. And we could drop in the shots as soon as we we, we oh, had them, so we could gosh. you know really see if they're matching up yeah. and really timing out right, and we had the move right, and and the whole time Brandon and I kept going, I just wish this, they had a bigger one of these. And then halfway through <laughs> filming, they announced the high, the iPad, and we're like, this, oh my god, and it's like they heard us, you yeah. know, and. And we started looking at like, okay, they're gonna call them applications, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like things called apps. And I'm like, I'm telling you, we got to figure out a way to do something for this, and because we've got everything in place. I mean, we've got a story, and we've got all these assets, and let's just get an iPad as soon as they're out there and start figuring out how we can make something for that. That's a story application. <laughs> and Brandon was like, yeah. And our agent and everybody else is like, no, that's crazy. You don't know, like that could be a flash mm. in the pan. Like, get the book out and do the, then do the short. And then if this thing with iPads is, you know, takes off then do that. I'm like, you know, I just got a feeling we're the first, mm, like totally. we're gonna get we're gonna get noticed for it, and and so the, and again it was like the fun part was it was like you know because I started at Pixar when there was like thirty people there and nobody knew what they were doing, and that was part of the fun, mm -hmm. and so here we are I'm like you know there's a lot of ingenuity can happen when you don't know what you're doing, and. But you got a good feeling about a technology, and I had a good feeling about that technology, and so we just adapted what we had in ways to try to make it work for the iPad, and you know, and then that, and that's really what helped us like survive and take off because the app went through the roof and you know sold a lot and kind of paid for the short film and. And then when the book came out, it was uh, the number one New York Times bestseller. And it's now, it's like translated into 47 languages. I mean, wow. so it's amazing. It's a business model that I don't think it, it, we, it happened that time because everything was so new. And I, it, I don't think it will happen quite that way again. Mm -hmm. uh, but it sure was fun to ride that way and to try out that stuff and see that, yeah, it actually worked. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's definitely what inspired, I'm sure, a lot of indie filmmakers, especially, and definitely us, where you can be so creative and forward thinking. Mm -hmm. So it's if you're making film, it's not you just don't think about what they call conventional filmmaking. That mm -hmm. you, because it's a story, it's a character, it's a world that you're building. So you can do, you can apply that to anything. So mm -hmm. you make a book, or you make an app, or you mm -hmm. make. Uh, television or the product or the you know and then movie and you don't necessarily have to wait for one to be successful like mm -hmm. you guys you guys just did it because you're like ah it kind of works for this and you should do this and you don't you weren't necessarily thinking how that's gonna be successful or make money but it's more like it was exciting to you guys at that time and and we saw it as a great opportunity mm -hmm. you know I mean, we were at the right place at the right time with the right money and the right technology and, and, and all the things that, like, you know, I remember sitting there thinking, there's not that many times when there's a technological shift and, and, and you've got everything you need to maybe take advantage of it. And I felt like we really had a shot. And so it was super exciting to see that we were actually able to pull it off because like I said we didn't know what we were doing because nobody knew what they were doing because right. this stuff was so new but you know it's the same thing I've thought about computer animation for a long time is like 
there's not a way there's not a, a way of doing this and I feel like almost immediately with features it was like this is the way features are made that's the way animated mm-hmm. features are made and I'm kind of like this is a new medium I mean we should be trying all kinds of ways and there shouldn't be this just set methodology to making a feature film so let's it doesn't I mean you know Buster Keaton those guys they were making it up as they went along mm-hmm. you know movies were so new mm-hmm. and and it, there's no it, it just depends on the talent it depends on the vision it depends on the individual to make us all fit into this sort of preconcepted way of manufacturing a, a film is it's silly it's that's not what the technology is for is to free you up mm-hmm. and so we wanted to see how much freedom or chaos we could cause and not do something crummy <laughs> I, mean, I think to me that's what's so impressive about it is the fact that there, it's not just the timing of what when the app came out or even the books that you put out. They're all of such high quality in terms of tasteful design. And also, I feel like you always introduce a world. It's never like, you, I always, whenever I read your books or see any of the, the stories that you've come up with, it's always this place that you want to spend time in or want to see more of. Um, and that's different. I think that's something very unique yeah. um, to what you do is that you create worlds. It's not just a singular character. It's not just... And you, you can spend more time in it. Like going in an app or even though you've seen the film, I want the book. I want, I want to just spend more time in these places that you create. And I'm curious about... And I, we get asked this all the time, so I don't love this question, but I mm-hmm. also am just geeky kind of I just want to understand a little bit of your process and I know there's probably not just one way but when you're at the start line of something or what is kind of the start line of of something um, for you like you talked about robots as kind of this drawings a series of drawings and designs um, I'm sure it's different all the time but you know for where you are in your career do you have a bit of a process <laughs> you know there is I would love to know what it is. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. You know, it's like the muse comes, and I. It's very sweet of you to say that you know you want to stay in the worlds that that I create, and and that is a thing I always. I do know that I, I that is something I think about a lot. I'm like. I want this place to be a place you want to be. Mm-hmm. And because, you know, it's just with, and a lot of it comes from just thinking about the movies and stories that I've loved my whole life, the things that affected me when I was growing up, that stuck with me, that inspired me to become a filmmaker and a storyteller. And so when I sat down, I looked at some of those movies, you know, like The Wizard of Oz and uh, Errol Flynn's Robin Hood and, and, like the original day the earth stood still. I mean, there are all these, uh, the, the, the old Ray Harryhausen movies, you know, there was a quality to film back then mm-hmm. and, and to the craft of the worlds that they created because they took great, great care in creating these believable worlds. And that craftsmanship resonates. Even if you're a little kid, you sense it. And so when you look at the designs of even like the, the everything in the Wizard of Oz is so beautifully art directed. It's just delicious to look at. It's and you know so I started analyzing some of these movies like that and trying to just get the gist. Like why do I love this? Why is it resonating in my head in a way that won't go away? Why is it coming out in my paintings? And in a way that I don't have a choice with. I mean, it's like this is, it has changed my thinking. It is in my DNA. I want to draw these things that invoke that. And it doesn't take long once you look at something that you love to start to understand the mystery of it. And, you know, it's like just old Technicolor was so sumptuous and beautiful hmm. and, and not real. I mean, it, it's so removed from reality and if you 
you know, you look at film today and you look at that film, you know, they couldn't be more different. Like, you look at a film from that era and, 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 and for ser several decades after that, Technicolor film, like, takes away detail. And in so much of what we do in, in computer animation is, you know, we try to put in everything. Mm -hmm. And then we're so in love with it, we want to see all of it. Mm -hmm. And to me, it ends up, a lot of times it ends up feeling like there's too much, there's too much information there. So if you do what, it, what Technicolor did, you take away information, you make everything into this sort of velvety, fuzzy blur. And that's what, I mean, it, the, the film grain is so, <laughs> the individual hunks of film grain, you know, you can see them. They're like the size of luggage, you know? Like, I remember seeing when, when Fantasia 2000 came out, and they had, you know, Sorcerer's Apprentice in it, and they're, and they're projecting it, you know, you go and see it on an IMAX, so you're seeing it bigger than it had ever been seen. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, check it out, man. It's like the film grain, that's the size of a shoe. I mean, it's like, <laughs> and, but it blends everything together. It makes it this sort of painterly, yeah. removed from life, better than real reality. Mm -hmm. And the, the costume designs, like the munchkins and... And every little detail, like Dorothy's dress, they're just these sort of, it's sort of appealing, instant iconography that these things are, as soon as she shows up, it's like, it's, it's, that's a thing that burns in your memory. That simple, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, blue check dress is so well designed. There's, they had this, this um, the costume designer, Adrian, that designed the movie, and he just he had such good sense about a clean, simple, silhouette and shape mm -hmm. for the characters and though the film seems very elaborate if you sit and actually watch it you know the silhouettes and the, and the designs of the of the, the the craziest costumes are are really boiled down to a, a, a series of very simple graphic shapes especially like the wicked witch i mean her hat the cinched um waist the the long black uh, billowing um skirt the the cape that's sort of behind her i mean all these things and she's all points you know like she builds from skirt to hat to pointy nose to pointed fingernails and the her, that crazy green that she is and then the unbelievable ruby red of the ruby slippers and the, the yellow of the yellow brick road i mean these colors just like toast your childhood brain mm -hmm. and so that's kind of what helped me start thinking like when I build a world I need to try to think in those beautiful graphic simplistic appealing terms that's awesome wow that's so cool that's awesome <laughs> so much passion yeah that's great well you yeah. know look that's what we do totally <laughs> yeah. I think that's kind of one of the reasons why we went to visit you um, I think Someone else I kind of keeps thinking about when I think of you is like Glenn Keen. Like mm -hmm. both of you guys achieved so much in your career, but then you guys are still hungry to challenge more, mm -hmm. and and that, that's what you were doing then, mm -hmm. and that's what you're doing now. And mm -hmm. and it it is we if we ever get to where you are in our careers, oh, we, you're, we you're there, be, man. What are you talking about? No, but we want to <laughs> be there, like always hungry always kind of not in this is not enough we want to challenge ourselves even if that means we're challenging ourselves with something we've never done before mm -hmm. like when you say like i don't know what i'm doing there's yeah. a truth to that in a way because you were at the top of the children's book you know author world you know when i was still in college i remember um reading a time magazine and mm -hmm. the most influential people in the world you know mm -hmm. they do every year and then bill was number one in the children's publication mm -hmm. uh category and that was when i was in college and you were starting a studio and making your own film and and now you you're moving to like you're actually doing another challenge mm -hmm. which we'll love to get to also but just so inspiring well, yeah, thank you yeah. guys. I mean, it's, yeah. you know, I, I don't know what to say to that. It's just there, mm. you know, a hunger for, mm. I know that, like, I'm doing the uh, fifth uh, Rise of the Guardians novel, right? And 
And I really never thought I'd write, I'd be a novelist, but you know, here I am. And I, it's actually one of my favorite things to do, but it's also the hardest thing. Writing a novel is harder than anything I do. Hmm. And it's harder than filmmaking. Because, you know, in filmmaking, you got, you're you sitting around and you're collaborating and you're, you're always bouncing off of people. And, you know, but when you're writing a novel, I mean, it is you and your editor. and But you're having to go into the density of detail that's further than the picture book and, and further than anything else. It's like making a movie all by yourself. Mm -hmm. And so, but like, the point I'm trying to make here is that this is the fifth novel and it's about Jack Frost and he's my favorite character in the, in the film and his favorite my favorite character in all the the lore of the Guardians and but I'm I, I'm tired of doing it mm. it's the first time I've been tired of something mm -hmm. and though I think it's the best book I've written I mean, I can't wait to not do it. <laughs> <laughs> and I have not experienced that before. Mm. So I think there's some, there's some hunger to always be doing something different mm. that I've paid attention to. And I would have paid attention to it this time, except, you know, I want to finish the story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the novels interlock, and this will be the last one. Oh, okay. And... And I have to because there's a bunch of people out there who read the books and they want to know what happened. That's right. And and I do too. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah. And and I really dig Jack. I like writing about him. Man, I can't wait to be done. <laughs> when 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 is it due or when are you It was due a year ago. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm writing it, you know, as we speak mm -hmm. and I'm flying to London and, and, and to France. At the end of this tour, I mean, you know, I go to Seattle from here, and then I go to London. And we start recording scratch track for the feature I'm going to do, and but I'm still working on Jack. I'll be writing Jack Frost on the plane, mm. and and the time is getting close to like, it, you know, they're going to get really upset, mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and I got to get it done, and I'll get it done. Mm -hmm. You always do, you know. I mean, you guys know those that when they go, this is the release date. You just you do what you do, and you can't believe that you did it, but you do. So, yeah. I'll be doing that. But man, I will, I will take a one week nap when I'm done with this guy, <laughs> and maybe drink for two weeks. <laughs> um, well, can we talk a little bit about what some future plans? Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. you talked a little bit about. A feature film yeah. on the horizon. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it's very exciting. Um, it's a story we developed at Moonbot, and I told I told my partners I said, "Look, it's I'm really tired of adapting my own stuff because there's always you know there's a certain you have to be brutal when you're adapting your own stories because you know it's it's a different medium. You know what works in print." whether it's a picture book or a novel or whatever, you know, when it comes time to, you have to completely think of it in different terms or think of it in completely different terms. And you got to kill a lot of babies when you're doing that. And, uh, and I've gotten used to that, but, but it's never like fun, you know? And so I was like, I want to do somebody else's story. And, and so maybe that, I'll feel freer and, and so uh, our producer, David Lippman, who used to be head of production at DreamWorks, um, I asked him, I said, well, you just go, like, find me a story. And, he, and so he went, he sent out people to, to uh, different book fairs, like the Bologna Book Fair, and that go on all over the world that were showcasing, you know, the new stuff that's coming out. And they found this book called The Extincts. Uh, by this young British author, and uh, it's her first book, and it's about a small farm that no one pays any attention to in the countryside of England, and for a really long time, it has been a secret refuge for extinct creatures and mythical creatures, mm -hmm. and 
this little old lady runs it and no one's ever questioned what goes on there she's been hiding in plain sight for like 2,000 years mm-hmm. it's one of those things where people go you know old Mrs. Lynn man she's been there like forever and, and <laughs> it's because she has <laughs> and these two kids that live in the village you know complications ensue a danger rears its head and these two teenagers uh, young teens a boy and a girl are uh, find out the truth and have to help save you know the farm mm. and and so I'm thinking of it sort of like Wes Anderson meets King Kong you know because mm. it has all these like I'm not supposed to go into too much detail but it's like you know it's got you know dinosaurs on it and, and on the farm and, and you know all sorts of mythical creatures and and but I wanted to be kind of wistfully romantic mm. and and sort of the way that say Moonrise Kingdom was mm-hmm. and and to have a, a sort of 1960s tone to it mm-hmm. and with music to match and that sort of a little like another movie I really I compare it to a lot of that, that I really admire is um, is the Beatles Hard Day's Night mm. and that was such a there, there's so much spontaneity and youthful you know enthusiasm in that movie and you really catch the sense of what it was like to be swept away by by youthful enthusiasm and and, and being hip and young and cool without even trying to be yip and yeah yip <laughs> hip and young and cool i mean the beatles just it's just i think it's one of the happiest movies ever made mm. and and so i'm gonna I'm kind of try to use the camera that way you know and kind of loose way and uh somebody mixing up some so it's gonna be bad it's it's all the stuff i love okay it's got creatures in it huge scale issues you know technicolor um beautiful english countryside you know a, a young girl and a young boy who just are getting their first crush like it's it's so i've always wanted to do that in a movie like that 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 unspeakable beauty of your first crush and and where you, you suddenly turn and you look at you know whoever and you your life ha- has changed like your every every ganglion and 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 atom in your body is suddenly devoted to the idea of romantic involvement with this person that a minute ago you weren't even aware of <laughs> you know when it hits you like that and and when you're 13 or 14 and that happens to you, it's such a beautiful, lyrical, poignant thing. And so the idea of having that happen in the middle of this big adventure just seemed, you know, to encapsulate almost everything I've ever wanted to put in, a, in the idea of a film. So there. <laughs> wow. That's, that's but I'm working great. with the Britsy brothers mm-hmm. and uh, who did... Um, uh, the Firebird Suite from uh, Fantasia 2000, and they are so wonderful to work with, and just poets, you know. And so far, it's a small team, but man, I, I love that. I've actually, I've, over the years, I've learned I, I really prefer smaller teams, and and where everybody just gets in a room and they start jamming, and cool things happen. So. Uh, if everything goes well, I'll be moving to France for like a year and a half, two years to to make The Extincts with Dwarf Studios in Montpellier. <laughs> wow. Wow. And then I'm doing a ton of books. Oh, so you're going to continue? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 And I've got another short film I want to do. I, I love the short film, like, genre, I mean, or whatever. I mean, it's just there's something... I mean, we all know because we've worked on features for a long time, you know, and the grind of that. And uh, it, I find short films to be a, a, a lovely alternative to that grind, you know. Mm-hmm. You know, it's much shorter production uh, time. Sometimes it takes you just as long to make a good short. Mm-hmm. But uh, I don't know, there's something freeing about uh, challenging and freeing and, and, and having a. Uh, a dozen minutes or so. Mm. You got to be really precise. You got to get your stuff figured out. Mm-hmm. You got to keep it simple. And movies are very simple too. 
And as you're finding out, as you're trying to develop Dam Keeper into a feature, I mean, I'm sure that story is fleshing itself out, but you have the key of what you needed, right? Mm -hmm. There's a simplicity there. I mean, and that's the hardest thing that I've had to learn in the course of my career is that stories are much simpler than you realize. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe this is a That's good stopping point. <laughs> yeah, it feels so great to have you here at Tumblr oh, House and just so inspiring to hear your stories and just so much respect from our generation and even oh, younger generations thank you. just looking up to you and, and you're still continuing to challenge yourself with this new project coming up. And well, it's try really and stop me, but thank you. That's it's, I'm very flattered. It's very sweet. And I'm super excited about what you guys are doing. I'm so stoked to see you guys jumping into the fray and wish you every success i know you're gonna do great because you're you're scrappy and you're talented <laughs> so there you go thank you great. so much great fun being here